Okay, if everybody could take their seats, please. Thank you. Good. Okay, so it gives me really great pleasure to welcome to the University of Southern California a man who, uh, in just a few months' time, will need no introduction. Uh, the Honorable Ron Wyden, the senior senator from Oregon, um, and uh, uh, the incoming chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Senator Wyden has a long history of working across the aisle. He proposed a bipartisan comprehensive tax reform proposal, uh, as well as a large-scale uh, health care reform that garnered support from both sides of the aisle. He's been a leader in international trade and has worked to reduce barriers for the growing market for digital goods and services. And as a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, Wyden has been at the forefront of reforms to the nation's surveillance laws and a staunch supporter of privacy rights and civil liberties. I got to know Senator Wyden uh, during my tenure as Chief of Staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation, which as you all know is the nonpartisan tax resource to Congress. I thought I'd give you uh, an insight into the four kinds of members of Congress that I got to work with. Uh, most members uh, fought, fell into one category, which is uh, they ignored uh, everything about uh, nonpartisan advice. They had made up their minds uh, and really had no interest in data or analysis that might conflict. There were a few members that I got to know who thought that um, by constantly yelling at me, the, the data would magically reorganize themselves <laughs> into ways uh, that would better suit uh, their objectives. Uh, there were a few savvy members of Congress who um, understood how to use nonpartisan resources to solve for their predetermined uh, uh, outcomes uh, and uh, advanced their uh, agendas in that fashion. And there was one member of Congress who wanted to understand the issues. Uh, he wanted to reflect on what was best for the country uh, and he wanted to find points of agreement with the other side. And finally, he wanted to implement a carefully constructed proposals that would reflect uh, all that he had learned. That man of, uh, was, was Senator Ron Wyden. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, here at the USC Gould School of Law, the man who is the incoming chair of the Senate Finance Committee, and I think, frankly, a real friend to tax policy, the Honorable Ron Wyden. So nice. Wow. What, what, what an inflationary introduction. <laughs> Those are the kind of introductions where you say, oh, I wish my, can you all hear that? Am I ringing off the, oh, how I wish my parents could have heard it. <laughs> my, my how about if I just take this off? No? How about if I speak like this? Okay. My father would have loved an introduction like that. My mother might have believed in. <laughs> so, um, it's very good to have a chance to be with you. I'm up at 5 o'clock this morning because of Ed Kleinbard and Len Berman. And both of them, they are part, and I know we've got some other leaders in tax policy here. As far as I'm concerned, they are really the NBA all-stars. <laughs> of the tax reform uh, debate. Uh, I guess we're going to have the real NBA game next weekend. I went to school on a basketball scholarship. I was dreaming of playing in the NBA, a preposterous theory because I was too small and I made up for it by being slow. <laughs> so um, you're kind of having the NBA all-stars get together because I know we've got other very distinguished uh, tax scholars here. You're kind of doing it a week before the other NBA game. And, um, and I appreciate the, the chance to, to do it. Um, suffice it to say, what is going on with us, you probably heard we have a big snowstorm in my hometown in Portland. So I'm going to go from here to southern Oregon to have town meetings. And I'm sure one of the first questions I'm going to get asked, because there's been a lot of discussion about it, is you're going to be the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. What? What does that do? <laughs> and you know, I just I have this sense that people are kind of wondering if I can get them a three percent home loan or something. <laughs> Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, what, what do they do? But obviously, 
uh, we have jurisdiction over the tax, uh, tax code. And <clears throat> I particularly appreciate the chance to be with all of you here today because it seems to me this is an important time in terms of talking about the growing inequality of opportunity in our country. I understand you've gonna had some presentations already. And I thought the way uh, I would begin is by way of saying, I think we all understand there are a growing number of very valuable government reports that have been written on these issues and academic treatises about this growing uh, inequality of opportunity. But if you really want to get a sense of what I think the real world challenge is, it's time to focus on what I call the Neiman Marcus and the Dollar Tree economy. And I want to be very specific about it. I don't know if you saw it, but the New York Times ran a front page story Monday last, and the reporter comes right out of the chute and pretty much says what I think this debate is all about, at least what I think the debate's all about. The reporter starts the article by saying, I'm just going to quote right here, as politicians and pundits in Washington continue to spar over whether economic inequality is in fact deepening, in corporate America there really is no debate at all. The post-recession reality is that the customer base for businesses that appeal to the middle class is shrinking as the top tier pulls even further away. They go on to say the Olive Garden and Red Lobster restaurants, we all know, are struggling but Ruth Chris's and the Capitol Grill are growing. <clears throat> High-end hotel chains like the Four Seasons and the St. Regis saw revenue per room increase at almost twice the pace of the mid-scale chains, the Best Westerns. And even among household goods, GE reports that the increase in demand for the high-end appliances, dishwashers and refrigerators, pretty much dwarfs the, sale, uh, dwarfs the sale growth of mass markets. And it seems to me what we're going to be faced with is whether or not we're going to say that it's acceptable to play this sort of zero-sum game, or are we going to have policies, Ed touches on in his book, Len touches on it in his book, it's kind of the NBA all-stars, you've got to have a really great book, and both of them do. Um, you've got to find a way to bring the middle class back in uh, to this uh, equation. And I don't see how the math really adds up if you don't, because consumer spending is driving 70% of the economy today, and it is not that different than Henry Ford saying basically he wanted to be very successful, but to be successful, his people had to have enough money to buy, uh, buy his cars. So. I want to kind of outline some of the steps that I think are part of the equation. My staff wrote this really just humongous speech. I think what I'll do is put it in the congressional record and mail it to you. <laughs> so, you know, have it. Todd Metcalf is wonderful. He told me he was going to be listening in on, I know you're streaming this live, so let's all be nice to Todd. Um, and let me kind of walk you through where I think this is. The first kind of debate will, in my view, um, address the whole question of the minimum wage. And I strongly support raising the minimum wage because it just seems to me as a fundamental proposition it is unacceptable in a country as rich and decent as ours for any American who works full time to be living in poverty. So let's kind of just sort of stipulate to that as a priority. But I want to offer up that if that's all that's done to address, as I characterize it, the inequality uh, of opportunity, I think we are going to be missing a lot of what needs to be done to address, as I say, the Neiman Marcus and Dollar Tree uh, economy. And, you know, the reality uh, is that you ought to start with some basic kinds of challenges in terms of laying what this all is about. The first, it seems to me, is dealing with the gap between wage income and investment income. 
And the reality is we made a little bit of headway on this matter in the fiscal cliff deal. Not a whole lot, but at least we got started. And it seems to me we ought to build uh, on that. What I've done in the tax reform proposals that I've offered in the past, and Ed made mention of it, Len knows about it, it's the really the only bipartisan federal income tax reform proposal since the 80s when a big group of Democrats got together with Ronald Reagan. What we said is, okay, let's find a way that's progressive to narrow the gap. Let's have an exclusion and we can debate what the percentage ought to be in terms of capital gains income. But on top of that, we're going to essentially tie those earnings to ordinary income and treat them in a progressive way. So what that means is, if you're a widow with a few shares of telephone company you know, stock, you're not going to get hammered. But if you make all of your money, all of your money on capital gains, you will pay proportionally uh, more. And I think that is um, appropriate. And a big part of this stems from my interest in trying to look at this now in a broader kind of, uh, of fashion. And that applies even to some things that I feel very strongly about, like green energy. I come from the state of Oregon. We got green in our chromosomes. We are as green as you possibly can be. But we can come up with a better, more growth-oriented, fairer tax code than simply filling it up with an alphabet soup of breaks like the PTC for wind and the ITC for solar and Section 25C and 179D and a whole bunch of other kind of numbers that probably only Len and, uh, and uh, Ed would uh, understand. And these disparate pieces of the code, if we continue to just prop them up forever, are going to have this dysfunctional mess of a tax system just grow and grow exponentially. And we have to find a way to, uh, to break with it. So uh, I've said we're going to try and move to broader reform. Uh, certainly in the short term, we're going to have to deal with these extenders, the research and development um, credit, the renewable energy credits, um, the one that I think is very important is this one for mortgage debt, you know, where the amount people owe, I mean, this is like just about as basic for people who are hurting in this country as you can, you can get. You've got to do those in the short term on um, something like that to show that the tax code is not just for people who were born on third base and thought they hit a triple, but for broader kind of policy reasons and both short term and long term, you ought to look uh, to doing that. And the point of the extenders, which I just mentioned, is to serve as a bridge for broader reform. In other words, you're not going to do broad reform in the next 20 minutes. What we need to do uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid has filed a one-year extension of these extenders is use it as a bridge to uh, broader reform. In terms of those um, broader reforms, I mentioned the question of narrowing the gap between uh, ordinary income and investment income. And let me just tick off uh, several others that uh, Ed and Len are very familiar with. We, in our bill, and as I say, there have been two Democrats, uh, myself and Senator Begich uh, of Alaska, and then uh, Senator Dan Coates and Senator Judd Gregg, two Democrats, two Republicans, agreed to triple the standard deduction. Now, what that means is if you're making fifty or $60,000, you're basically putting $30,000 uh, off limits to the exchequer. And my own view is if you do that, Maybe Sears and Macy's and these middle class stores that are hurting so might start seeing a little bit of a comeback and we'd start building up that economy that gets beyond Neiman Marcus and, uh, and Dollar Tree. A third area that we focused on has been uh, simplifying and enhancing the earned income tax credit, which uh, Eric and others have uh, written about uh, over, uh, over the last few years and I think that is also uh, an area that 
uh, I think warrants a lot of attention because it's an opportunity to get right to the heart of trying the earned income tax credit and the child care uh, credit goes right to the heart of what has been best about the network of federal anti-poverty uh, programs. This is a chance to help people work their way out of poverty and uh, improve, uh, improve the economy at the, at the same time. And I think we ought to start by extending what has been passed in, uh, in recent uh, years. It's set to expire at the end of 2017. And it seems to me we ought to get on with, uh, with the task of, uh, of doing that. My friend and colleague in the Senate, Senator Sherrod Brown, of Ohio has really been the leader in this. He's introduced a bill called the Working Families Tax Relief Act, which really strengthens uh, the earned income uh, tax credit, helps uh, full-time uh, workers to be eligible for the maximum uh, credit, and I think uh, that is long uh, overdue. And we saw an example even when Secretary Paulson uh, years ago was trying to fill out the tax returns of uh, these dummy W-2 forms similar to that of a typical low-income family, you saw why these kinds of approaches uh, are so uh, important. With respect to the child credit, I would, as I indicated, like to make the current enhancements permanent. I'd like to index the child care uh, credit because it's been flat for a number of, uh, of years, and I'd like to lower the eligibility for the first dollar of earnings. That's also been a part of the earned income tax credit, and it's something that you can do for a relatively modest amount of money, and uh, there's a fair amount of academic research that would suggest it would yield good returns for a small uh, amount of money. On the savings front, I think we have to start with the proposition that the vast majority of savings are delivered through the tax system and have mostly gone to people who have incomes well, well, well above the national uh, median, median. So we ought to be trying to look at ways to start the march to try to create the incentives that we need for those, uh, those people who are trying to uh, be part of that uh, economy that isn't just ne Neiman Marcus and, uh, and Dollar Tree. And probably the best way to start that, and it's something that we're going to spend a lot of time trying to uh, think through, is I believe that at the time of birth, a savings account should be established for every child born in the United States. And there are a number of good proposals that have been offered uh, in the past. It goes all the way back to Senator Bob Kerry, for example, of um, Nebraska. Um, most recently, uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Santorum, not two that you would see line up all the time, um, have offered, I think, a very thoughtful proposal called Aspire, which I think could really uh, put a dent in the poverty rate by automatically setting up and funding a special account at birth for every single child. I'd like to see those funds be allowed to grow tax-free, let them later on be used to pursue post-secondary education, buy a first home, build up a nest egg for, uh, for retirement. But I'll tell you, the statistics for children with savings accounts just take your breath away. Uh, research shows that children with savings accounts will be up to seven times more likely to attend college than those without an account. This is true regardless of a family's income, race, or educational attainment. And even a few hundred dollars in savings designated for education can significantly improve a child's educational uh, outcome. Low-income and moderate-income students with savings of one to $500 designated for college are three times more likely to enroll in college and four times more likely to graduate from college than their peers. And here are the principles that I'd like to lay out. And if any of you are going to do great papers on child savings accounts and uh, want to have big thoughts for the Senate Finance uh, Committee, we'll welcome them. And the first principle is we want to make sure they're universal. 
I mean, we want to make sure that every single child is given an account at birth so we understand that this is another one of those efforts to bring the country uh, together and help save and develop assets and, and, and uh, build wealth. We want to make sure they're lifelong. While uh, people have different savings goals that depend on a whole variety of considerations, age and personal uh, circumstances, uh, the need to save is pretty much a lifelong endeavor. Third, we want to make sure that they're progressive. Research has demonstrated that even families of modest means, they're obviously constrained by circumstances, can save. Those families, however, have absolutely no access to federal savings incentives, and that's why I made mention of the fact most of the incentives go to people in the upper brackets. So making them uh, progressive is uh, absolutely uh, essential. And finally, they ought to be offered up with what people clearly understand is asset building. And that's why I want to contrast it to the minimum wage. I'm a strong supporter of the minimum wage. And we know what good it does for the economy because when you get an increase in the minimum wage, I was with a, bo a bunch of folks at a grocery store in Portland, Center Merkley, and myself, one of the points we mentioned, when they get their increase in the minimum wage, they are not going off to Europe to buy goods at some fancy store in Paris. They're going to use that money locally. So it's a very important thing that we do it. But we still have the challenge of accumulating wealth. And that's why I'm stressing some of these other kinds of op opportunities in a strong savings uh, uh, program. Uh, while it shouldn't forbid the uh, use of savings for a number of different purposes, ought to focus on, uh, on asset uh, uh, building. I also would like, as I'm talking about child savings, count to, uh, child savings accounts, to mention how important it is to simplify the array of retirement savings and, um, and, and security. We have a whole host of, of programs pretty much strewn all over the country. Retirement savings, we have defined benefit plans, defined contribution plans, 401ks, 403bs, simple SEPs, IRAs, Roth IRAs, and I guess the list just goes uh, on and on. And I, in the tax reform proposal that I offered, move to consolidate those. I'm sure there are other approaches, but if we really want to get um, retirement savings uh, to get the maximum bang for those, uh, those dollars, we ought to make it possible to consolidate them. And I'd also like to see ways to initiate automatic retirement uh, savings for, uh, for workers. And finally, I want to mention the important work that's being done with respect to skills training and training uh, opportunities. And a number of my colleagues on the Finance Committee have done some very good work uh, on these issues, and I want to mention just three in particular. Senator Debbie Stabenow has introduced a bill called New Skills for New Jobs Act, which in effect builds on successful efforts to boost community colleges when they partner with uh, local businesses. Senator Menendez has introduced the Better Education and Skills Training uh, Program, which in effect offers a competitive tax credit program to encourage job training partnerships between local schools and local uh, businesses. And Senator Cantwell, my colleague in the Pacific uh, Northwest, is really the leader of an effort to promote apprenticeship. And my view is that we are, and Senator Cantwell makes a very compelling case for this, we are lagging behind most of the industrialized world with respect to these apprenticeships. And she has outlined in a piece of legislation uh, a proposal, the Basic uh, Training Act, where we believe our economy could really catch up and uh, and excel. And so you know exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about a job in which a worker is paid to learn a set of skills through on-the-job training. So it's not an internship where the worker works for little or no money or receives not a whole lot of training. An apprenticeship follows a earn-while-you-learn model and leads to a credential that would be nationally recognized that recipients can take anywhere 
in, uh, in the United States. And we have something like 7% of the number of apprentices in England adjusting for uh, uh, population size. So let me use that as kind of a, an opening salvo. There are other areas that I felt uh, strongly about. Um, infrastructure investment, and Ed will recall this, um, for years I had been sort of pounding away on a rock pile uh, around the idea that there were ways to generate more investment for infrastructure, more dollars for investment that would be politically viable. We know we have these huge, huge infrastructure needs in the country. We now pay for it with this gasoline tax, a little over 18 cents. There are not going to be any rallies outside a senator's office at this time saying, please raise the gas tax. It's just not going to happen. So after years of sort of proselytizing for the government to think about bonding in the Recovery Act, right at the end of it, Chairman Baucus decided, I think perhaps to get me to stop talking about it, he said, we're going to go with this proposal that I had been advancing for so many years that Republicans would retire they'd have grandchildren, they'd do all kinds of other things, and I'd just move on to my next wave. And I had proposed something called Build America Bonds, which offered a modest direct, um, stipe, uh, a direct grant to states or a tax credit. And on the last night of the markup on the Recovery Act, when out of nowhere the leadership of the committee said they were going to do this, they asked me what I thought would happen. I said, well, I'm just making this up. I'm so surprised anybody's called on me. But why don't we say that we might generate three to five billion dollars worth of uh, investment in Build America bonds? And everybody goes, yo, Ron's at it again. That's a great idea. We're going to do it. We're going to do his Build America bonds you know, program. Last count, $182 billion worth of Build America bonds. There is a market out there, folks. Some of that trill, multi, what is it, Len, $2 trillion overseas? Ed, Len, our, our vindicators, validators? $2 trillion parked overseas, lots parked in the United States. They are looking for good places to invest, and I think infrastructure would be uh, part of it. And I'm going to close with really uh, this. I'm often asked, what is my philosophy in terms of tax reform? And I've had a pretty simple tax philosophy. I want a tax code in America where everybody has a chance to get ahead. If you don't have very much, I think I've outlined some proposals today with a kind of specific target of trying to build up the middle class in an economy that is splitting more and more between folks at the top and going to Neiman Marcus and folks you know, who don't have much going to Dollar Tree because they're doing well. Um, I want to make sure folks who don't have much have a chance to get ahead. And I want to say to people who are successful in America, you will pay your fair share. But your government and the tax system are not going to do anything that is going to keep you from being successful in the days ahead. And I think that is essentially what a big group of Democrats and a significant number of Republicans did in 1986. Len was there. country uh, created 6 million new jobs in the two years after that tax reform proposal was enacted. No one should, with any degree of academic integrity claim that every one of those jobs was due to tax reform because that would be absurd. But it certainly helped. And my own sense is the big mistake that was made in 1986 was to not have something included in that bill to make it tough to unravel it because the unraveling pretty much started as soon as the bill got passed. And no current Congress can ever permanently bind a future Congress. But a current Congress can sure make it tough to unravel something that's in the uh, public interest. So for all of you who've been in the tax reform uh, precincts, we'd very much like your ideas and, uh, and your suggestions. You can call Todd Metcalf nights and weekends. Uh, <laughs> and he's sitting there listening you know, to this. But I do think under the banner 
of tax reform that gives everybody in America the chance to get ahead, as opposed to this dysfunctional, rotting mess of a carcass that we call the tax code, I think this would be good for, good for our country and exactly the kind of thing we need to have to bring us together. Thanks for having me. Do you, do you Let's see if I can get some water okay. and then softball Does questions will be welcome. Oh, is oh, that mine? Yes. Uh, yeah. I just want to say my daughter. Can you wait for the um, uh, microphone, please, so oh, they okay. can hear you uh, on well? Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to tell you that since you're heading for Southern Oregon, you might be interested to know that my daughter was born and raised in Beverly Hills. And the minute she could leave, she headed for Medford, and she's got a five-acre place uh, on, on Griffin Creek Road. Oh, I know where that is. You do? Good. Well, I'm going to give you my card with her number, <laughs> just in case he might, he might, uh, you might get over there, and, and she'll get a chance to meet you. Thank you. And that's I would appreciate nice. getting a picture with you. Of after course. You're all full of course. up here. That's, that's very cool. I, I, yeah, I enjoyed your presentation. It's Thank just you. very so sharp. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And if you, if you want to start, we can repeat it, too, and we can just keep it going. Go ahead. Uh, Ron, uh, what, what are your ideas for this uh, family, this, uh, you know, uh, count for all families uh, that where you would consolidate, you know, IRAs and uh, 403 plans? Would it operate very similarly? It would go into any kind of investment? Well, I, I think we want to maximize choice for the consumer. Let's kind of tick them off. We want to maximize choice in a way that consolidates, you know, the programs. I mean, our most recent bill, without kind of getting into the root canal work, kind of, kind of highlights it. Now, the president in the my, R, my RA kind of approach seems to be thinking that he wants to have kind of the best of two worlds, sort of a new savings bond kind of approach that blends into that. And I'm very open um, to that. And we'll obviously have to see if you can do it administratively, as you've already seen, you have some of the conservatives saying, oh, it's another backdoor approach to spending money and starting a big government program and, and, uh, and, and the like. But, but consumer choice, um, consolidating you know, the programs that we have today, and particularly bringing it home with the child savings account. That, that to me, because I spent a lot of time kind of thinking through what happened um, when Bob Carey, Bob Carey really started it more than 20 years ago. You can actually go online and you can see a speech he gave in the National Press Club, in effect, as part of the run-up to his presidential you know, efforts. And he was right then, and most of what he has to say makes sense to me now, because I think about what's going to happen if and when we pass the minimum wage hike, which I strongly support, and everybody calls it a day. We've got to find a way to accumulate wealth. Uh, on the child savings account, you said you wanted it to be progressive, and you're talking about people who don't have an income tax liability. So by progressive, do you mean some sort of refundable credit or something? Well, certainly that is one of the possible you know, approaches. And with respect, you could probably see that except for the two bills which I've actually written, so you get a sense of my thinking, what I've tried to do today is kind of outline some ideas because I want to talk to senators about them. In other words, on the child savings account in particular, my seatmate on the Finance Committee, Senator Schumer, has done some very good work on this issue. And there are other senators who've been interested in this as well. So I don't want everybody walking out of here and saying, you know, Ron has got this bill in his back pocket. These are areas that I want to talk to senators about, but certainly a refundable credit kind of approach would be clearly one way uh, to go about it. But there are some others that I think we ought to, ought to be thinking about that would help us start those accounts, particularly for a poor children in a progressive way. Yeah. 
So I, I know many people say that Washington isn't able to come together, and obviously you've done some work to build build trust across the aisle. So kudos to that. Um, one of the uh, areas of tax policy that you mentioned that has had challenges in terms of reform is the gas tax. And I was wondering, what do you think are the prospects for uh, a bipartisan approach to reestablishing some measure of the user pay principle by shifting a portion of the gas tax to be a percentage of the value of gasoline? So it wouldn't be an increase in the tax rate, which conservatives would oppose, but one that would structurally enable the gas tax receipts to increase in time as the price of gasoline increases. Um, and as a law student here at USC, I also just want to say thank you very much for speaking up on the NSA programs. Well, first, with, with respect to the gas tax, I do not want to front run my colleagues on this. Senator Boxer is the chair of the Environment and Public Works uh, Committee, and I'm going to be working very closely with her. We have already met, and we're going to have to be looking at options both short term and long term, because as you know, the trust fund is running uh, out uh, here very quickly, and so we're going to have to be looking at some ways to address the short term. And what I want people to understand is we are particularly going to be focusing on longer term approaches and particularly ones that will make it attractive for some of this money that is parked in the private sector to invest because the Build America bonds sold like hotcakes and they were for big projects, big states and big projects used them. And so I think we know we can bring some of that money into funding uh, infrastructure in a politically viable way. So if you'd like to flesh out your idea and others, I'd be glad to look at it. Let me talk a little bit about this NSA situation because we are really at a flashpoint in this um, debate. I don't know if you've seen the comments by some of the tech companies you know, recently. These are people who don't spend normally a lot of time on politics and what their style has been. Invent the product, let it grow, innovate, build your brand. And I have had CEOs sitting in my office practically apoplectic about the damage that these NSA practices are doing them, the kind of restrictions that foreign countries are talking about with respect to their servers. I mean, these are going to be very, very serious problems if we don't take steps now to come up with the kinds of reforms that ensure the government can get the information it needs when it needs it to protect the American people, but we don't just have the government picking up everybody's you know, phone records because it thinks the people in the intelligence uh, uh, leadership thinks it makes sense to build the highest you know, possible you know, haystack and that somehow you can build a bigger and bigger haystack and the needles are still going to be uh, viewable. I don't buy that. I mean, we're taking these steps that are putting at risk American liberties without making us safer. So the damage to the brand that is being done in many of these companies, as you know, are in California, while simultaneously threatening American liberties, is something that I feel very strongly about. And uh, I will tell you, it's going to be a very tough battle because the intelligence leadership is really doubling down for the status quo. And these are the people, for example, who told us, and you can see it on YouTube, we don't hold data on US citizens. All right? That was said not by you know, some person who's somewhere um, in the chain of decision making. This was said by the head of the NSA. We don't hold data on US citizens. It's one of the most false statements ever made about US surveillance. And so we now need to make sure that we have uh, policies that ensure that liberty and security are not mutually exclusive. And we can do it, but it's going to mean some very, very tough battles with hopefully a lot of people like yourself speaking up. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a lifelong teacher and a national board teacher, and I've done my doctorate, and I have gone through court 
and improper. I've gone to U.S. Supreme Court. I've had everything stolen from my house and everybody else around me regarding that court case. The next thing I want to bring up is educational student federal loans that are having issues primarily with private universities and the information is stolen, so it's ID theft again. And the third thing was, is um, digital ID hacking through the internets, American systems, through AT&T, through some of the other national and important internet systems. Those are three major identity thefts. Thank you. Hard from the seat of my pants to kind of just rip off a variety of ideas. If you'll give me a phone number or an email, I'll make sure one of our, our folks uh, calls you. But you are not alone. I mean, the laws, the consumer protection laws in this space have not kept up with the times. And I'll tell you, it's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased that Elizabeth Warren has come to the United States Senate, because she really gets these consumer protection issues. She's responsible for finally getting the Consumer Protection uh, Bureau uh, enacted in the law. If you'll give me a phone number and, and something like that, I can follow up. If Ed is on his feet, that should be a signal that I should be off mind, and I am happy to do that. More than anything, I wanted to come today to say we're open to your ideas and, uh, and suggestions. I mean, suffice it to say, anybody who thinks tax reform is about their going off and writing a bill. Even though Senator Gregg and I and Senator Coates, Senator Gregg and I sat on a sofa every week for two years, and he was Mitch McConnell's economics lieutenant, we sat on a sofa every week for two years to produce that tax reform bill. Tax reform, Eric and others have, have talked about this. It's not like you have a thunderbolt down from the sky and everybody goes, okay, that's tax reform. Tax reform means you have to look at the interconnections between these various um, you know, provisions. Senators from different, uh, different uh, parts of the country and um, from different parties will have differing uh, views. And there is an old saying about tax reform that it is always totally, completely, and thoroughly impossible until 15 minutes before it comes together. <laughs> And so this Congress, we're going to do our best to pass Senator Reid's bill and get these extenders so that we're not going to harm the economy in, uh, in the short term. And for the longer term, you're going to hear me in the Senate Finance Committee talk about how America can do better than to have an economy where Neiman Marcus and Dollar Tree are doing well and the middle class keeps falling uh, behind. And we'll welcome your ideas and thoughts. Thanks for having me. You, you have to get to 1,000 oh, Oaks. Okay, you, have, okay. you have to get to your next meeting. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, the chairman has to get to his next meeting, so please um, don't uh, tackle him on his way out the door. <laughs> <laughs>